So Revelation chapter 3, verse 10 says this, Because you've kept my word about patient endurance, I will keep you from the hour of trial that's coming on the whole world to try those who dwell on earth. So most people who teach this passage, who believe in a pre-tribulation rapture, teach this hour of trial as being a figurative or metaphorical hour. It's not a literal hour. It's not a literal hour of 60 minutes. It's a figurative hour. And certainly there is um, that interpretation is a valid interpretation of the word hour in many other passages of scripture. But are we meant to take this word hour figuratively in Revelation chapter 3? This is the letter to the Church of Philadelphia. These are the people who are staying faithful to God. Whoever these people are, they're going to be kept from the hour of trial. So what are we looking at here? Is this a literal hour of 60 minutes? Or is this a metaphorical, figurative hour of seven years? So John wrote both the gospel and he um, penned the book of Revelation. And in John's gospel, he uses the word hour both in a figurative sense and also in a literal sense. So let's take a look at it real quick. John chapter 2, verse 4. This is the wedding at Canaan. And Jesus said to her, to his mother, Woman, what does this have to do with me? My hour has not yet come. So this is a figurative hour, a divinely appointed time when a certain thing must happen. And Jesus was telling his mom that my hour to be the declared Messiah or be brought forth as the Messiah is not yet. <laughs> but he went ahead and changed water into wine anyway. John also uses the word hour in its literal sense in his gospel in John 19, 26. And interestingly, this is about his mother too. When Jesus saw his mother and the disciple whom he loved standing nearby, he said to his mother, woman, here is your son. And then he said to the disciple, here's your mother. So from that hour, the disciple took her into his home. So we're talking about a literal hour from that time, that hour when Jesus was on the cross and getting ready to die. Jesus gave his mother into John's care. There's a lot of examples of time in Revelation, a lot of day counts, a lot of month counts. We've got uh, 1,260 days that the woman is in the wilderness, and that's in Revelation 12. We're also told that she's in the wilderness being cared for for a time, times, and half a time. Time is one year times is two years and half a time is a half a year so that's three and a half years so 1260 days and three and a half years it's the same amount of time so it's interesting that we're given um, this period of time that the woman is in the wilderness in two kinds of measurements so that we know we're talking about a literal amount of time we also know that the beast is going to reign for 42 months, that's in Revelation 13, and we know that Jerusalem will be trampled for 42 months. And the 42 months that the beast reigns, coincidentally, is the same three and a half years, 1,260 days that the woman is in the wilderness. So all of these uh, units of time here are all talking about that same period of time that we call the Great Tribulation, from the abomination of desolation until the second coming of Christ. So when we talk about the woman in the wilderness, we talk about the beast and the 42 months and the time times and half a time, most people who teach prophecy believe that that's literal. That That's a literal 1,260 days. It's a literal 42 months. So what about the word hour? the hour, the hour of trial. Are there any other places in Revelation where it talks about an hour and it means it literally, that it's a literal hour? Well, interesting that you should mention that because yes, there's several other passages where we're led to believe that we're talking about a literal hour here, not a figurative one. So let's take a look at Revelation 9.15, and I think this is the most uh, specific example of an hour being literal. So this has to do with the sixth trumpet, at the end of which a third of mankind is going to be killed. And I would consider that an hour of trial that comes on the whole earth. Revelation 9.15, so the four angels who had been prepared 
for the hour, the day, the month, and the year, were released to kill a third of mankind. So what we're led to believe is there's a specific year, and there's a month in that, that specific year, and actually there's a day, and down to the hour when this uh, four angels will be released and a third of mankind will be killed. We're pretty much talking about a literal hour on a literal day. It's not figurative in that passage that has to do with the sixth trumpet. So our key verse, Revelation 3.10, because you've kept the word of my patient endurance, I will keep you from the hour of trial that's coming on the whole world. So are we talking about a seven-year tribulation here in that hour, or are there other examples of an hour of trial? So let's take a look at Revelation eleven thirteen. At that hour, there was a great earthquake. A tenth of the city fell. Seven thousand people were killed in the earthquake, and the rest were terrified and gave glory to the God of heaven. Later on, uh, when you read a couple verses down, we're told that the second woe has passed. So the second woe is the sixth trumpet, and the sixth trumpet only lasts an hour. So we're making a connection there between the sixth trumpet hour on a specific day, month, and year with this hour of the second woe. The next passage passage we're going to look at is Revelation 14, 7, and 8. And he said with a loud voice, fear God and give him glory because the hour of his judgment has come. Well, that sounds like a trial, an hour of God's judgment. And we know that God is going to judge the harlot, Mystery Babylon, right? And let's take a look at verse 8. And another angel, a second, followed, saying, fallen, fallen is Babylon the great, she who made all nations drink the wine of the passion of her sexual immorality. So we're being told that an hour of judgment has come and that Babylon has fallen. Uh, Revelation 17, 12, and 13 talk about an hour again, and this is in the context of Mystery Babylon, Babylon the Great, and her judgment. And the ten horns that you saw are ten kings who have not yet received royal power, but they are to receive authority as kings for one hour. Together with the beast, they are one mind, and they hand over their power and authority to the beast. So the ten kings and the beast have one hour where they are going to be given authority and power to be able to kill the harlot, to get, destroy the harlot. And then in Revelation 18, there are three places that talk about a single hour. Revelation 18.10, they will stand far off in fear of her torment and say, Alas, alas, you great city, you mighty city Babylon, for in a single hour your judgment has come. Revelation 18.17, for in a single hour all this wealth has been laid waste. Revelation 18.19, and they threw dust on their heads as they wept and mourned, crying out, Alas, alas, for the great city where all who had ships at sea grew rich by her wealth, for in a single hour she has been laid waste. So we know the sixth trumpet and the second woe are the same thing. And we know that there is a single hour when the harlot will be destroyed. And what if that hour of trial in Revelation 3.10 is actually a literal hour, that same hour when the harlot is judged, the same hour that the sixth trumpet blows, the same hour of the second woe which is passed, leaving in its wake a destroyed Jerusalem. What if that single hour is the hour which comes right around the time when the two witnesses ascend into heaven? And what if that hour of trial is, in fact, a, a literal 60 minutes when a third of mankind is killed during the destruction of Mystery Babylon? What if it's describing a literal hour and not a seven-year tribulation? So are there any passages in Revelation where it's clear that a measurement of time is figurative? And actually, there aren't any passages that talk about time where it's made clear and obvious that we're just talking about a figurative or metaphorical amount of time. And we also are not talking a day for year conversion. That's never mentioned at all in Revelation. In fact, God goes to great pains in the book to make these equivalencies so that we're no, we know we're not doing a day to year conversion. So what are the implications? I guess that's kind of the bottom line here. 
if <laughs> the hour of trial is actually referring to that hour when Mystery Babylon is destroyed, which will basically be the same day that the two witnesses ascend into heaven, which is the same day as the abomination of desolation, then we're not talking about a seven-year tribulation. And we can't use Revelation 3.10 as a pre-tribulation rapture passage. It is a rapture passage, though, but it's not for us. It's, it's for somebody else. It's for another group. So the implications to our eschatology are really huge if the hour of trial is a literal hour. And someone who takes it as a figurative hour would have to show me some other place in Revelation where it's a time is used figuratively and not literally. Even the half hour of silence in heaven is a literal half hour. It's not a figurative or metaphorical half hour. So the implications really are quite staggering when it comes to our interpretation of eschatology. We'd have to rethink what the letters to the seven churches are all about. We'd have to rethink who they're written to, and in particular who the uh, letter to the church of Philadelphia is actually written to. So what if... <laughs> Those escaping the hour of trial are not you and me, but may actually, um, this may actually be pointing to another group who will be raptured before uh, the abomination of desolation occurs. What if this is the rapture of the 144,000 that we see in Revelation 14 who are in heaven with the sound of harps and singing the song that nobody else can sing? So, those are some of my thoughts. I'm going to leave a link to a couple of videos in the description box. You can let me know what you think, and we'll see you on another video. Till then, have a blessed day.